Good afternoon. My name is Monica Valentine, and I work in the Library of Congress. Sharon Robinson is the award-winning author of several books, including The Hero Two Doors Down, Under the Same Sun, Jackie's Gift, and Jackie Robinson, American Hero. She is the daughter of baseball le legend Jackie Robinson, the first black player to break Major League Baseball's color barrier. She carries forward his legacy today as an educational consultant for Major League Baseball and as the vice chairwoman of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. In her newest book, Child of the Dream, a memoir of 1963, due out September 3rd, Sharon writes candidly about her life as a teenager during the emerging civil rights movement and the role her family played in supporting it. She shares with the reader the racial tension she experienced as one of only, a, one of only two black students in her Connecticut high school. Sharon explores the impact of the civil rights movement on her life, her family, and the world from her unique perspective. Please give a warm welcome to Sharon Robinson. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. I love these bean bags, and I have too many things, so let me just put something down here. So, I'm so happy to be back in Washington. I actually lived, I have a tail, so I'm, it, it's kind of trailing behind me here, it feels funny. Anyway, um, I'm so happy to be back in Washington. I went to college here, went to Howard University, and um, I also then came back and well, as a faculty at Howard and Georgetown, so uh, it's always wonderful to be back here. I'm here with my family. Can my nieces please stand up? Sonia and Meta. thank you for coming. Meta took the bus down from New York, so she gets the the real prize today, she traveled the fur furthest. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to share uh, Child of a Dream with you. It's a memoir. Um, 1963, I turned 13. And my, the inspiration for this book was the Children's March in Birmingham, Alabama. So I'll tell you more about that as we go forward. But it's, I wanted to write about the Children's March for a very long time, and I did a lot of research about it. and. We kept trying to you know, work with my editor, trying to figure out from what angle I wanted to tell the story. And finally, he, he convinced me to do it as a memoir. And I, I wasn't thrilled with the idea. Um, but as it turns out, he was absolutely right. And in the research, um, as I found out, I had to do research on myself as well as on my family, not just on the civil rights movement um, when I was preparing this book. Um, so. I'm really, the reason why I like it, the, the blending of the stories is that turning 13, are any of you guys 13 or 11 or 12? Any 12 year olds, how old are you? 10, okay, you're close. How about you? 11, okay. Well, I have a 13 year old grandson, so I know, I, I'm very, very familiar with these transitions uh, in this next generation, but um, for me, it was a, a big turning point and one I was very nervous about because uh, my older brother, uh, after he turned a teenager, he, he, he really struggled. And I was like, you know, I kind of anticipated that I was going to be struggling as much as he, he was. So um, it was also 1963 was such a pivotal moment in our country um, in terms of us really pushing the civil rights movement forward and getting to the point where we got the um, Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. So it was, um, and it was also a very important year for my family because my father, who I'll tell you a little bit more about after, um, he had been going south for the movement and traveling across the country and coming back and telling us stories and my brothers and I were integrating our schools in Stanford. Um, but he, you know, we wanted to go, we wanted to travel with him. We wanted to be a part of the larger movement. We didn't really feel like what we were doing was you know, working towards change. 
you know, we, we kind of took it very personal and just thought we were just, you know, integrating our schools, but it wasn't anything like what was happening down south. So we didn't think very, very much about what we were doing, but we wanted to be part of the larger movement. And my father um, did not agree to take us to Birmingham, but he said he would work it out. So in 1963, he uh, defined for us our family mission and our family, and essentially our, our family legacy. And so it, it's a year I will never forget, and I will never forget his words to us. But I'm kind of going to share this story with you um, through pictures. So, you know, one of the things my father told me uh, right up front was that, uh, you know, you can't, we may pass this bill, we may pass this civil rights bill, but that's not going to, doesn't mean we'll eliminate hate. And yet I found that my parents, also taught me to hope, and that if we lifted our voices, we could make a difference. So that's the kind of work I do with kids in schools, and have for the past 24 years. Um, and it's, I think it's effective because I judge it based on a, an essay contest we've done for 24 years, where kids have to define an obstacle in their life and, and talk about how they're getting beyond it and in that process and show the process of moving forward. Um, and then I go out to the schools and, and visit the, the, it's an essay contest, so the winners in their schools and we bring them to ballparks. And also a, a, we're honoring one of them this year at the World Series. So, you know, it's a program that encourages kids to speak, to have a voice, and it also lets them know that we care, we're listening. And uh, from what they tell me, and many of these kids have, have stayed in touch with me, you know, it really did help them feel, gain confidence. And that's, that's what my work has been about. And that work is actually with Major League Baseball and Scholastic. Um, so anyway, so I want to tell this story a little bit through pictures. I just finished this C-SPAN and <laughs> the incredible, uh, Peter said, showed pictures, these same pictures I'm going to show you that are in the book. And he said, so are, are all these pictures setups? And I was like, yeah, you know. Uh, so you'll see that they're lovely pictures, and I'm very happy we have them in our archives. But most of my family shots were for Life magazine or something like that. And you know, we didn't have it, phones with instant cameras back then. So this picture um, is my birthday, and that's my mom and dad and my brother, my older brother, Jackie. And, you know, we, we, we really did celebrate birthdays, but this was a setup. Uh, so my younger brother, David, was born, um, he, well, I won't say what year, because we don't want to discuss the years that we were born. But anyway, he's my younger brother. He's a little younger than I am, not much. Looks older, though, I'll tell you, I don't know. Um, he lives in Tanzania, East Africa. David is a coffee grower and the father of 10 children. So he has repopulated our entire family. Um, so when David was born, we moved from Queens. Uh, actually, Queens was a, our neighborhood in Queens was an integrated neighborhood a number of um, ball players and entertainers, black inter uh, entertainers lived in this neighborhood. And the reason why we moved was my father wanted uh, privacy. And so he wanted to have land. And we moved to Stanford, Connecticut. And we had uh, six acres. And we were, had woods on all the corners of our property. So it did give us the privacy we wanted. So we really had a very normal childhood in that we had a great deal of freedom on our property and we loved nature and we loved all of the activities around the lake so uh, it, that was important to us because when we left our property we then became a public family and we understood the difference and um, it, but it was fine because we had all this privacy at home so ultimately we, we sort of agreed that it was a good decision but as we became teenagers uh, that we didn't need all that privacy as teenagers. We needed friends. 
Um, and so it became uh, more of an isolating experience as we entered our teenage years because the black friends that we were beginning to make were, lived downtown and it was 10 miles of a public bus that ran you know, every five hours or something. You know, we had to walk a mile to get to it. And we, so we didn't have great access to our friends downtown. So this is um, an, another setup shot, I will admit, but this is my family. So I, I think probably uh, in the late 50s, probably just shortly after dad retired from baseball. Um, this is after he's announcing his retirement. And we actually had a trophy room in our house. Um, and we had a, it was kind of interesting because our playroom, and I put quotes around that because I'll tell you why. But anyway, in our play, we had to pass through the trophy room to get to our playroom. So you, our friends were always stopping and looking at trophies, and we were trying to pass through as fast as we could, you know, because as we got teenagers, it created a, a certain anxiety to go through this trophy room. Like, you know, what, what, how, will, what are we going to be successful at? And it, it really brought up questions for us. Um, but in the trophy, in the playroom. My brother Jackie, um, who is a very good pool player, uh, he, my parents bought him a, a, a professional pool table. So that took up about, Sonia, do you remember that pool table? Where's Sonia? You do, yeah. So the pool table took over half the playroom. And then my father, when he discovered there was such a thing as an indoor golf range, he took the other corner over here as his you know, for his indoor putting, uh, which left me, I, my favorite thing was uh, making milkshakes. So I had the soda fountain, uh, which, you know, so that was our playroom, but, but um, so in 1957, my father retired from baseball, and most of you kids probably know my dad is a baseball player. Am I right? You heard of Jackie Robinson, the baseball player? Yeah, no? Yeah, okay. So he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And the Dodgers are now, where are the Dodgers now? Anybody know? LA, yeah. And, and we're gonna be in the World Series this year too, I must. And we're gonna win, my prediction. Maybe we'll play the Yankees, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> um, so, in 19, so he played for the Dodgers a total of 10 years. And he retired in 1957. So what happened is my father started playing for the Dodgers when he was older because, remember, he broke the color barrier, so he didn't have an opportunity to play with them when he was a younger, per, a younger man. So he played later in life, which meant he retired at, in his late 30s, which is sort of normal. So when he retired, and this particular picture is um, us when he's, you know, having this, you know, they do parties or ceremonies or whatever around the retirement. Um, it, it actually was a surprising retirement because my father had been traded to the Giants and we, you know, that was our hated team, the New York Giants. So he knew he wasn't going, but he told him I'll do the best. I'll give it my best shot. And then immediately set forward his retirement plan and announced it not at a press conference with sports writers, but in Life magazine. So this is one of the ceremonies. Now, I, I want to point out a person in this picture, and I don't even know if my nieces really know her very well. Oh, over here, I'm sorry. I'm pointing down here, you can't even see that. But this lady here is my grandmother, uh, and that's her name is Zelie Isom, and she's my mother's mother. She came to live with us when we were 10, and you'll see in the book, um, Zelie, you know, was so important to me. Um, she taught me to cook, she taught me to knit, but more importantly, she kind of helped me have a structure during my teen years, uh, and I would come home, and, and so my grandmother wanted me to be a nurse, and she wanted to guarantee that I would be a nurse, so I would meet her in her room after, when I came home from school, and we would have a knitting lesson in front of General Hospital where she would point out all the virtues of the doctors and nurses. And then as I got older, she said, told me that in her bedside table, she kept romance books about doctors and nurses. So that was like even saying, see, you can even have romance if you go into this. Anyway, my grandmother got her way. I became a nurse. 
This is my best friend, Candy. Um, Candy and I continue to be close, although we live, she lives in London and I live in all over, in New York, Florida. Um, but we, so she's a, a partner in this book. And it was Candy and I, Candy came to um, Hoyt when we were in fifth grade, so that meant I was no longer the only black child in the school. It was Candy and I, and that sort of helped us through uh, junior high school. This is our junior high school pick. I love the hair. I, we, we used to tease our hair back then, you remember? Even, even the black girls teased their hair a little bit, so everybody's hair stood up very high. This is my dad. After he retired, he became vice president of Chock Full of Nuts. Um, so his first year in re after retirement, he made a deal with uh, Mr. Black, who, owned, who was the president of Chock Full of Nuts, that he would be able to travel for the civil rights movement. So his first year, he was a fundraiser solely for the NAACP, and he traveled the country uh, raising money for them. The NAACP at that point was our premier legal organization. We needed them to change these laws we were trying to change. So this is uh, my dad and Dr. King became, started doing some partnerships um, when, when my dad was uh, elected to the Hall of Fame in 1962. <clears throat> Dr. King had a, a dinner for him at the Waldorf Astoria, and it was to raise money for SCLC, so now he was also raising money for SCLC. And then Dr. King would have him come down to various things. For example, when Dr. King was in Albany, Georgia, which he was just before they moved into Birmingham, um, my father came down for a voter registration drive, and they, he arrived the day that two churches had been bombed in Al Albany, Georgia. And Dr. King, my father, made a contribution right then for the rebuilding. And Dr. King said, would you be the lead, the fundraising nationally for churches that had been bombed? And so that was my f their first kind of collaborative fundraising activity. So I opened the book with a scene from my 13th birthday, which is, was a really low-key birthday party. At this point in my life, I was just having sleepovers with girls. And, um, but this year, I only had one person at my party. And I was, so I was creating my, when I started writing my book, I was writing this first scene of my 13th birthday. And I knew Candy was there. And you know, I kind of knew what we did. But you know, I was writing, and I go, wait a minute now. Was Jackie home? And that's when I realized I'd done all this research on the civil rights movement and Dr. King and Birmingham and my dad and blah, blah, blah. But I'd forgotten to you know, recheck some facts about us personally. And so I went and did my research and found that my dad was actually in the hospital and had complications from surgery. My dad had um, diabetes, so he, he had complications from surgery. And so he was not home for my 13th birthday. We had to go to the hospital um, to, to celebrate with him. But I also was worried about where my brother was, because my brother had gone um, to boarding school. And I didn't know if he was back from boarding school um, or at that time or not. So I looked, uh, you know, I was looking up those kind of facts. But from that, I, you know, my, my brother David and I, this is current, we're doing, we're going through my mother's attic for looking for items for the museum, for the Jackie Robinson Museum, which we're building in New York City. And in that process, we came across, my mother had kept files on each of us. And we found my, my report cards. I mean, it was like a treasure chest. She had kept my diary from when I was 12, the year before the book. And I found, all, she kept all the letters we had written to she and my dad. Um, so that was very helpful in the research because it helped me remember my voice from 13. Because, you know, if you're looking back when you're a child, you have to remember, you know, like, you know, how did you talk and what were you doing and what were you thinking? So in my diary, as juvenile as it sounded, reading it now, um, it also helped me see where I was at 12 and how I ha had this big shift when I turned 13. So my dad, um, after doc, he did some work with Dr. King early, Dr. King now moves from Albany, Georgia into Birmingham with the Birmingham campaign. And um, 
they, the Birmingham campaign, uh, they were doing marches and the, with adults and families to raise awareness and try to change the rules in Birmingham. So it was like, for example, the, they closed down the park just so that the, um, the blacks would not come to the city park. So they wanted the park open to all people. They had businesses, the Birmingham community had created their own subculture and, and their own um, town almost, so they could have all the resources from stores and, and grocery stores and department stores and whatever within their own community because they were not allowed to shop downtown Birmingham. So the whole, the marches were, were, and they also, schools of course were segregated, but they learned from Albany, Georgia that they can't cover everything in one campaign. So they kind of narrowed the focus and, they, and said the other thing they wanted to do was to uh, desegregate schools, but they wanted to set up a committee to make that happen and not expect to do it in this three, three month period or four month period. So anyway, so they had, they weren't having, they weren't galvanizing enough adults. And you know, there was opposition um, from white ministers and he written, this is when King goes to, to jail and he, they, the white ministers protest him, him coming into their town, stirring up trouble, outsider, you know, we're working this through as a community. So Dr. King responds, because now he's in jail by the uh, letter, uh, um, with his letter from a Birmingham jail. So um, in this photo here, Dr. King has invited my father, my father brings Floyd Patterson with him down to Birmingham because they need help, they need support. And uh, so uh, my dad and, and Floyd Patterson come down and the day they come down, the next, it was the day after the AG Gaston Motel had been bombed. So at the same time, the beginning of May, King's uh, associates suggested having children march um, because the adults said they'd lose their jobs, you know, uh, they were scared, you know, whatever their reasons were for not continuing to march in, in enough numbers. They thought, let's try it with children. And there was opposition. Some people felt we shouldn't use children, and, you know, some people felt that it was an adult problem. But they started off with college students and then high school students. Anyway, by May 2nd, they had trained kids in nonviolence and these kids left their schools at noon, marched as they would leave one school, they would go to another. I don't, Ann Jemis is not here, is she? Ann is here? Oh my God, Ann, please stand up. So Ann, this Ann, Ann is, uh, I'm so glad you made it because I forgot to call you or remind you. Um, anyway, um, Ann has this online group called Kids in Birmingham 1963. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to, as I'm writing this, I wanted to talk to kids that had actually been involved in this march or been involved in Birmingham during this time. So I, another friend of Anne's and mine connected us together and I read the profiles online and I called it, or text, wrote, I don't know how we communicated, emailed or whatever we did. But I asked Aunt, told Aunt I wanted to speak to two people who had been involved in this Birmingham period. And Aunt connected me to Dale Long and Janice Nixon, who I now consider my family. Um, so we spent exhausted time on telephone and we met. And then they invite, Aunt and Janice invited me to Birmingham, which was my fantasy when I was 13 because I wanted to go with my father to Birmingham and be a part of this movement and meet these kids and all. And they invited me down and, uh, you know, it was just an amazing time, so thank you, Anne. But so they, they really were instrumental in my research and understanding this period. So th this is the, so this is after they visited the A.G. Gasson and my dad and Floyd Patterson also stayed at this same hotel. <clears throat> they did a rally at one of the churches. So this is from that rally. 
Okay, so moving from Birmingham, and I'm sorry I'm talking so fast. It's, it's a lot of history, but I just want you to kind of understand the context. So what my dad said to us um, after he came back from Birmingham, this is after the children have marched and they've been mobilized the whole country, including President Kennedy, because the, they were peaceful and singing and, and holding placards for freedom and ending segregation, and the uh, authorities turned the fire hoses on them, knocking, literally knocking kids off their feet, and also they had threatened kids with dogs. And that went public, it, went, it was like, it, it, today we would call it going viral, but you know, this was 63. So it was as fast as it could get spread. But people from all over were writing to Kennedy and, and writing uh, editorials in, in newspapers saying, this can't be. This can't be happening in America. So, you know, you probably hear some parallels. You know, this, so anyway, moving on. So my dad came home from Birmingham and said to us, you know, I hope you'll find work that you love and you always keep family and God as a priority, but we're also going to have a family mission. And this he really, so then he told us how, that, that since he's now been traveling south, he found a way for us, he and my mom had found a way for us to be involved as a family in the larger movement. And that's when we had our first jazz concert at our house. Oh, wait, I've got to go back one minute before I get to jazz. The first thing, we had a jazz concert to raise money for SCLC in our home. And my, my brothers and I had roles at that jazz concert, so it was our first fundraising activity as a family. And then we, in August, we came down here for the March on Washington. So this is a photo of my mother, my brother, and my father at the March on Washington. And then we had our second jazz concert at our home. This is our home in Stanford. You can see the, you know, the guests all sat on the lawn and the music was down at the bottom. And um, I'm playing the flute with Herbie Mann. Very nice. Anyway, and Dr. King actually came, and Roy Wilkins actually came to that jazz concert. So that's my mom and dad with. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King and Roy Wilkins. Roy Wil Wilkins was at that point the head of the NAACP. So it set in motion a family legacy that we continue today. We have a Jackie Robinson Foundation. Um, we, David and I, in our work, have been activists and, and doing community development, uh, me as a nurse midwife in women's health, and moving on to my work with children today and in my writing, and my brother David has this coffee business, but it's a cooperative of smaller African farmers, and they pool their coffee and sell it here in the United States and do community development in Tanzania. So this is a picture of my dad and I when I'm a little bit older, and we were at a, um, it was a push event, so we, you know, just kind of showing the activism again. So that's, so in, Child of a Dream, I talk about how I found my own voice during this 13th year. And it's, you know, for all of us, I was very shy in elementary school and never spoke up in class. I was mostly hiding. I wouldn't even wear my glasses. I was so shy. But that was because I was the only black girl and I didn't want another thing that made me different. Um, and so as I moved into junior high school, I was kind of forced into activism because I wanted to take Spanish. And I was in too low of a group to take Spanish. And I realized at that point that I had been tracked into a low group based on a test, not based on my, my grades, because I had my report cards. And I literally went to the principal and said, I want to take Spanish. And that would mean I had to be moved up two groups and we worked it out, and I was, uh, he asked why, and I gave him my reasons. And I moved up two groups the next year and took foreign language. But that was my first time I spoke up for myself or believed that I had a right to speak up. And it worked. And from that point on, I tried other things of activism. Um, but it's, you know, finding your voice is something that's really important, and when I talk to you guys about 
finding your voice. I'm really talking about, you know, feeling confident in yourself, believing in yourself, and being able to, uh, you know, if you're having trouble in school or if you're having trouble socially, you know where to go for help because you believe it's, you deserve more. Okay, so that's what I really talk about when I say finding your voice. So that's why I wanted to write Child of a Dream because I had to go through that same process myself. And it's um, one, I mean, now I can talk in front of you and feel confident, but it wasn't always like that. Does that make sense? <laughs> oh, good. All right, so I don't, where's my timer? Uh-oh, wrap it up. Sorry. Can I ask one question? Can we ask for one question? No, sorry, I forgot to look at you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much.